I am just thrilled. Let's put our hands together as we welcome both Tom and Phyllis Benegas as they come to the platform this morning. Appreciate you guys. Be led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you. Good morning. It's great to be here today at Genesis Church. And thank you, Pastor Wendy, for this opportunity to share about our mission. We are your missionaries to Europe, based in Belgium, which is the home of Continental Theological Seminary, which is just a very fancy term for a Bible college. <laughs> and uh, we serve there as the campus pastors, and we're loving that. CTS, which is what it's called, is the largest accredited Pentecostal Bible college in Europe. And most years we have students come from over 20 different countries in the world. They come from Africa, Asia, North and South America, the United States, of course, and Canada, and they come from all over Europe. So it's quite a blending of young people. And they come for one purpose, and that's preparation for ministry. And um, as the campus pastors, we are in, invested in serving them and challenging them in their spiritual life as students. And this is something we take very seriously because 95% of our students go on to be in ministry of some sort, which is quite astounding, that many. And we want them to leave our college full of the Holy Spirit so they can reach their countries for the Lord. And I have good news. Our students are more hungry for God than they've ever been. We have special prayer meetings during the week that they don't have to attend if they don't want to, but they come. They are seeking God. They're praying for each other. They're praying for this college. They're praying for the lost, and they just have a burden for God, and this is exciting. Um, I think it's because we all there understand that less than 3% of the population of Europe, which is three-quarters of a billion people, less than 3% claim Jesus or the, know the Lord in a personal way. Now, that's a mission field. And um, I know we're struggling here in the United States. I think it's somewhere in the 30s, the number, percentage of people that know God, and we know how bad it is here. So you can imagine what it's like over there. It's a very dark place. And our students know that the only thing that is going to pierce the darkness in Europe is the Holy Spirit. He's the convictor. He's the one who guides us and leads us. And so our goal is to have them very filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, one of the things that this touch of the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives while they're students is it's giving them a burden for the lost, even while they're training. And um, I want to tell you one quick story. We had a student come from the Middle East to school a couple years ago, and he was so burdened when he would go downtown and see the homeless on the streets everywhere that he linked arms with our church, Brussels Christian Center, and started a ministry to the homeless, a feeding program. And this was just one of our students, burdened for the lost. And he, um, through, through his burdens, several miracles occurred. One, Donated to our church was a complete commercial kitchen that to feed the homeless, to prepare the food. It was a miracle. And the greatest miracle was the commune or the government in that local area fully endorsed this program. <laughs> so for a secular government to endorse this, it's, it's, Tom will tell you a little bit more about that. So... Um, our CTS students, who have, re he's now moved on and gone back, but our CTS students now are continuing the outreach. They're going out Fridays and Saturday nights, feeding the homeless, ministering on the corners, and every weekend they post the people that have, they've brought to the Lord, people from Poland, people from all over the place, that they've prayed with them, and some of them have even followed on and come to the church, so 
they're reaching out and ministering even while they're yet students. So, you know, I want you to know this makes a campus pastor's heart very happy. <laughs> this is good news. And so we're, we're totally blessed by it. So thank you for your partnership with us. We couldn't be there without you. We really couldn't. And so you're a part of all of this that I'm telling you about. God is going to bless you as well for your partnership with us. So stop by our table in the back. Um, I'll, back there I have a, a copy of my book that I wrote, Breath from Heaven, which is about the COVID experience I had while in Brussels when the um, pandemic first started in 2020. And um, it's a miraculous story how God spared my life. But even more importantly, I was 21 days in the hospital, couldn't see anyone, just saw nurses in full masks and everything. But God was there every moment. He gave me beautiful tools and things to do to pass the time when I couldn't see Tom, when I couldn't um, talk with anyone because he's such a faithful God. He's with us no matter what we're going through. And I think this book might be an encouragement. You may know someone going through a trial. He's with each one of us every step of the way. So God bless you. It's great to be here today. Amen. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here today. Uh, we just love your pastors so very much. They're doing such a wonderful job here leading this church. Um, because I was in Lakeland for the last, what? well, not the last 10 years, but before that, 24 years, uh, I've watched the genesis of Genesis Church. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you're doing really, really good. And uh, God bless you. And thank you, Mary, for the songs today. What a great worship time we had. Uh, in fact, the first song, I don't know the name of it. I don't think I've ever heard it before, but it, it resonated in my heart. And I love that line that said, uh, bring your kingdom near, may the darkness fear. <laughs> and that's where we are, and that's who you are, people who make darkness fear. <laughs> and we don't, often we don't think that in our brains. We don't let our brains think that. But but that is an absolute truth. And, thank, and so my name for the song is Book of Acts Song. <laughs> because it's all about what God did in the Book of Acts. What a great song. Thank you so much. And that, your worship team is wonderful. They're just wonderful. I just, uh, in fact, Wendy, you're not, you're not going to like me for this, but you guys can travel with me anytime you want to. <laughs> No, I'm telling you, it was just wonderful, and thank you so much. What a joy to be here. I remember last time I was here two years ago, Wednesday night, it was raining really bad, you know. <laughs> it was just pouring. And so uh, Nat and uh, Wendy were so apologetic. Well, it's raining, and it's small, and there's no one's going to be here. But there were enough people here. It was just a great night. I'll never forget that. It was just, just so much fun. So we're, we're really here tonight, today, to say thank you. Uh, for your support to us. Thank you so much for helping us. Um, um, uh, we, you know, we've already, you've already prayed. I mean, I've, I think I said thank you when I was here for praying for Phyllis when she was in the hospital because it was just a miserable moment. But it was uh, your prayers, the prayers of this church and people that, that, that cared for us enough to pray that spared her life. And we didn't realize how bad it was till after uh, the, when, when she went back to the doctor, she, the doctor said, uh, we didn't expect you to leave the hospital alive. And we didn't really know that. And, and so thank you for praying for us. And I got the residual off that prayer because I was alone for 21 days. Never been alone that long in my life. Couldn't cook. Just had a, a rough time in so many ways. But during that time, it was like the Holy Spirit gave me that undergirding strength that only he can give, and I wasn't afraid one day, not one day. And, and so thank you for praying for us. Um, uh, during that time, uh, my wife, the Lord visited my wife with some scriptures, but visited me also with some scriptures. And probably the dominant one for me was Romans 4.17 that I've been thinking about ever since then. It says, uh, as, as it is written, I have, I've made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God. 
uh, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. <laughs> That's our God. And of course, Abraham, this is about Abraham, and you know, you gotta, if you're a theologian, you've got to get the context of what it's talking about. And it's talking about Sarah having a baby when she's 90 years old. <laughs> and so, you know, I've got to just warn you, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but our God, our God is big. Our God is great. And another verse that really helped me during that time was 1 Timothy um, chapter 6, verse 13. It says, in the sight of God who gives life to everything. Our God is big. He gives life to everything. And of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made a good confession. He says, I charge you to keep this man command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. I'm ready for that. I don't know about you, but I am ready. I'm already planning my, my ministry in the millennium. I'm, I tell you, I've got some very specific things I'm asking God to let me do. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you because it's real political. <laughs> we don't want to go there. <laughs> but but um, um, at the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which God will bring about in His own time. How important for us to understand in His own time. Because I'm impatient. I was telling Nate earlier. My clock and God's clock are two different clocks. <laughs> My clock for his moving in my life is a lot faster. <laughs> and we wonder sometimes, God, what are you doing? What's happening? But do you know it's in his own time? God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. That's our God. Our God is big. He's great. So we're here today to say thank you for... Um, for our, you're supporting us in prayer and financially. Also, the children's uh, program gives to BGMC, and I'm here just to let you know how important that is to us. During COVID, our school kind of brags about the fact that we've got a huge library, uh, 40, 50,000 volumes of all the church fathers, the greatest commentaries, the, the best ever written, all the church fathers, the details about you know, you can get every church father and know all about his life and what they said and the heresies that came and the, uh, the, the solutions and all, all that. Our library is incredible. But during the COVID lockdown, our students couldn't come even to class. They, they couldn't be there, which means they couldn't come to the library. So how do we keep going? And some of our professors got online and discovered this uh, online library that's very expensive. And we appealed to BGMC, and they helped us pay that first year. And, in fact, every year they've been adding a little bit to it. We're asking again this year for We need $3,000 again to extend it. But, but, but the library now, I mean, we've got 40,000 volumes in the library, but now online students can get to 300,000 uh, articles on books that, that help them in their ministry and so in their, their education. And since we're a research school, based sort of on writing every class has requires an essay every semester oh, i would never have made it at our school <laughs> i'm telling you but by the time they get ready for their master's degree which requires a 25,000 word paper they've already been writing their whole years there in their last year uh, they have to write a 3,000 word essay for every class and so I mean, it's, 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 it's really cool how, how they, they make that happen. But the, the library is such an important part of our ministry and our work and understanding history and that, that whole thing. Anyway, thank you for BGMC for that. And then our, my wife mentioned the fact that we've got a great outreach that's happening. I'll tell you, this outreach is just ex it really exciting. And it's connected with our church, the International Church in Brussels, Brussels, Brussels Christian Center. And what God has done in the last three years is, is, is really, our pastor will tell you, it's unbelievable what's happened. Because of this student who challenged students and challenged our church to get involved in ministry downtown. And they got caught taking food that wasn't prepared in 
a legal kitchen. You know, I thought legal was anywhere where the fire is hot, you know. But no, <laughs> it's got to be, it has to have a special wall, special ceiling, special floor, special refrigerator, special stove, special freezer. I mean, everything has a code that has to fit. And so when they started cooking, they realized we've got to update the kitchen. And before long, people start giving. They, a, a, a hotel owner doesn't know the Lord, but he gave he gave this incredible stove and and other appliances for the kitchen and uh, some people that understood what it takes to have a refrigerator refrigerated room bought the ceiling and the wall and the floor <laughs> you know I mean, this is so bizarre you know i mean special material and why can't just a vinyl wall work you know, well, no it, it has to be this i don't know what it is but anyway so the pastor's taken me through, he's saying, and, and God put it on this person's heart for this, this person's heart for that, and now we have the, and the inspectors come, how many have ever, are there any building inspectors here, by the way, I just, I just, they know everything, you know. <laughs> God help me not to get political here. <laughs> but they came, and through that, they approved everything, and we got acquainted with the commune closer, got a closer relationship to where the commune supports, actually supports our ministry. <laughs> it was really, really cool. And so then, you know, I don't know if you heard about this, but Russia attacked Ukraine. And everyone in Europe is really mad. They're really mad at Russia. And so the support from normal Europeans going towards Ukraine is incredible. And so because our pastor is also the secretary of the Pentecostal European Fellowship, he knows all the pastors in Poland, all the pastors in Czech Republic. He knows all the pastors in Europe, basically. And so the, the burgermeister of our commune, the, the mayor of our commune, um, talked to him and said, well, we've got, we want to support the Ukraine. And do you know where we can send our support? And, well, you know, I do. I've, I know a few pastors. I, I know some places you could send it. And so we had like 15 or 16 truckloads one weekend of stuff of s supplies from our commune that went to Poland to Assembly of God pastors <laughs> in Poland to support Ukraine. And so all that has happened because of a student who had a burden for the lost. <laughs> Challenged our church to get our act together, you know, and, and, and do what our church is known for. I mean, it's historically been uh, a church reaching out to refugees. And it's just a wonderful thing. And so God has really... But so anyway, all that just to say thank you for Light for the Lost. You know, Wow, that was a long <laughs> statement there. But Light for the Lost, I promised our students that any literature you need, I've got some friends in the United States who will pay for the literature. And, and so we do that. And then most of all, well, not most of all. Well, no, most of all. <laughs> for Speed the Light, I drive a Speed the Light car. And uh, I uh, don't have a picture of it, but the car is a, a, a Nissan Qashqai. It's not a really elite car. Like all of our neighbors drive BM, B, BMWs and Audis and Mercedes, and those are the common, like the Fords of Europe, you know. And so, but I drive this little Nissan uh, Qashqai. It's the same as a Rogue here, but it is a wonderful car. Just a one, a, a little, little tiny engine, a lawnmower, 1.6 turbo diesel. <laughs> And it is a wonderful car. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Yeah, that's it. So um, anyway, and, and, and notice there, uh, I just two, a, a month ago, I passed uh, 200,000 kilometers. And I took a photo of the, of the dashboard. I just, <laughs> I want to save this moment so you can see that we are busy. This car has taken us in ministry. We, on weekends, we work with the International Church Network, which is why we originally went to Europe. Uh, and so we're in a different country just about every Sunday. And, uh, and so over the last few years, we've gone 200,000 kilometers. And uh, just driving in Germany is such a wonderful thing. I just, I just love it, you know. Miles. Pardon me? How many miles? Miles, it's about, what, 100 and, uh, 145 something? 120, yeah, 120,000 miles or something. Anyway, um, uh, I, I told some stories I didn't mean to tell there. Okay, okay, and then and so in our, in our weekend ministry, we work with uh, international churches, and uh, somehow or another, I got on the speaking team of a church in Sweden. So once a month, we go to Sweden, 
and uh, just love it. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Sweden, but where we go is the herring capital of the world. And so we eat herring, <laughs> fried herring, pickled herring, baked herring. It's just a, just a cool, just cool. But, oh, we're, it's the church. I'm, it's not the food, it's the church. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, once a month we're there, and one, one Sunday, just a couple of months ago, I was walking out, and there's this, this young person sitting on the back row. And everyone basically had left, and he's still there. And so I stop and say, hello, how, how are you? And what brings you here? Well, I'm a, I'm a Serbian refugee, or our family just moved here from Serbia. And when he said Serbia, just the political things just go off inside of me. Just, I'm just so mad at Serbia. <laughs> just, I'm just mad at Serbia for what they did. And because uh, I go to Kosovo, too, and there's a great church in Kosovo. And, and Kosovo is a Muslim country. Serbia is a Christian country. I mean, I think it is. They say they are. And uh, so he said, I'm Serbian. But I remember Kosovo. I remember the story the pastor there told me of, of, of when the Serbians attacked them. They, they, they tried to kill every male Albanian-speaking person in all of Kosovo. And you go there. He was the children's pastor at the time. Now it's just this incredible church in Pristina. Just incredible. And all the workers in the church, the, the, the people that basically are helping him run the, he's the pastor now, but all their dads are dead because of the war, because of what happened. They just, they just, it's just terrible what things that people do to each other in the name of God sometimes. But, so I said, I'm Serbian. Well, I've long since forgiven Serbia, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'll st I'm going to heaven. <laughs> You, you know, you got to forgive to go to heaven. <laughs> so, so I decided I want to go to heaven. And, uh, and so he said, I'm Serbian. And he said, I just, I just want to get connected with God. <laughs> you know? And I said, well, I can help you with that. You know, that morning I led him to Jesus. I gave him a Bible. You know, within a couple weeks he's bringing his friend Within a month, he has his whole class at the church. He's an evangelist now because he knows God personally. He's connected. That's where we need to be. That's why that first song we sang today is so powerful, because we're connected to God. And we know that our clock and God's clock are two different clocks, and his clock is the most important clock. So the steps in our lives are very important. The people we meet the places we go, the prayers we pray, our, our time of worship, all of the things that relate to our life because God so, so desperately loves us. Everything we do has meaning and has importance when we submit ourselves to the Lord. So all that just to say thank you for speed the light. <laughs> so I got to get going here. Um, so in our, our school, we're praying for a real awakening of God in Europe because Europe has, is secular, has been secular a long time, and has taught the United States how to be secular. And we're not a secular country originally. I just finished the book this week, David Barton's book, uh, The American Story, which talks about how the Bible is the focus of the Constitution, the focus of our civil liberties, the focus of everything and yet the secular is trying to totally erase all that and, and it's same as happening in Europe so we're praying for a great awakening I believe it's coming because the Bible is very clear Joel chapter 2 that Peter repeated in Acts chapter 2 in the last days saith God I will pour out my spirit on all flesh amen and so this morning I'd like to for the next few minutes I'd, I'd like to share some thoughts with you from Jeremiah 33 3 it says call on me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you know not. Let's just pause for a moment. God, just, just help us today to believe this verse. Help us, God, to, to live this verse. Help us to understand this verse today. We pray that you, your power will flow through each one of us through this verse that you give us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here is a very specific word to Jeremiah the prophet. 
This is God speaking directly to him and um, uh, telling him to call on, call on me. Because, I mean, the last part of this, if you read the context of this chapter, the last part is a very dark, very negative chapter. It's it, what God is preparing to do to Jerusalem because the people had secularized the law and, and what God had said and everything that Moses had taught and the miracles that had happened all up to that time, they had totally secularized everything. And so God is ready, to, is getting ready to bring judgment to Jerusalem. And so, I mean, this is really, really dark. But before it's dark, God says, call on me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you know not. That's where we are. We're in a, a dark moment. And boy, I can really wax eloquent on the negative. I'm, I mean, I'm a melancholy Italian, you know. I can be critical. I'm really good at it. I could write a book on, you know, on, on how to be critical. I could teach you some things that you don't know about criticism <laughs> that God has had to erase from my heart and my mind through his word. But before this negative darkness comes, he says, call on me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things. And so that talks speaks to Jeremiah at his time, the importance. Jeremiah, you are really important. You're important to me, God says. You're important to Israel. You're important to the world. And I want you to know something. If you'll just call on me, I will answer. And I'm going to show you some things that you don't even have any concept of what's going to happen. And so Jeremiah prayed that prayer. Isaiah had also said, seek the Lord. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And you know, that gives us such a powerful moment because he is near to us. Today he is in this room. He's close to us. And so let's call on him. And let's ask him, God, will you do great and mighty things in our lives and help us? So we serve a big God. I, I, I just want to leave that with you today. We serve a God who's big. You know, I love the Apple company. Well, I don't love them, but I mean, I appreciate some of their work. Um, and the Apple company is big. And sometimes they think they're bigger than God. Uh, I mean, they can do things that God does. They, you know, every once in a while, they update the software in my phone. I don't know if you've got any of the messages that says you need to update, update your software. Because if you don't, shortly we're going to not be servicing your phone anymore you know and i'm going how do they know that how do they know that my phone needs an update well they don't have anything on god i'll tell you that because god every once in a while sends a message to us saying hey buddy you need an update you know and we need to respond to the update well god is big apple is big but god is bigger disney I don't know if you know where they are, but they're a big company. And Amazon is bigger than that. And Google is bigger than that. And all of them together, some of them even think they're bigger than God, uh, especially Facebook. <laughs> oh. uh, so you put all these together. You know, I, I just am um, so kind of fascinated with, the, with the, era, the era that we're living in right now, especially Facebook. I'm really mad at Facebook. I, I appreciate Facebook. Mary and I are friends on Facebook. Have been for 12 years. And um, I, I like Facebook for that reason, because I can sing happy birthday on your birthday. I can send you a note if, if I want to talk to you. But I don't appreciate their censorship. Just last uh, two weeks ago, uh, my friend uh, Jeannie Tedder, some of you know the Tedders, they pastored in Bartow for many years. But they're in Atlanta now, and she leads the women's ministry. <laughs> And so she sent a note out on Facebook to the women's ministry in their church. What was it? Romans uh, uh, 5, 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and Facebook censored her. I'm going, what is wrong with you? I mean, and so I just, I'm being the sarcastic me, I sent a note to Jeannie saying, oh, I agree with Facebook. 
how wrong you are for spreading hope, you know. You need to quit that. You need to stop doing that. Facebook thinks that there's too much hope in the world, and we need to just let it go and stop it, you know. <laughs> Can you believe it? That, that here is a simple, encouraging word for people who need hope, who need joy, who need peace. And just the verse is all she said. So I put it on my Facebook page, too. And I just, I don't know if it's going to get censored or not. But, you know, so they're bigger than God. They think they're bigger than God. And, uh, and then the government. Let's don't talk much about this, but the government is big. And we got a lot of money. Well, we're printing a lot of money. <laughs> and so sometimes we think we're bigger than God. Now, our founding fathers did not think that at all. Not at all. Not at all. They were godly men and accused of being deists, some of them. And one of them was, but most of them were not. Even Benjamin Franklin, who is the most, you know. But I'll tell you what, he knew God. And he was a deist for when he was 20. And then... He learned a thing or two, and he wasn't anymore. And he was influenced by George Whitfield, the great evangelist. And he printed more of George Whitfield's sermons than any other printer in, in, in the country at the time. And um, anyway, uh, they knew God. And, uh, and um, so the government is getting to where they think. And the EU government, too. And forgive me for, for this all this. But just to say that governments think they're bigger than God. But... I want you to know today that our God is big. He's bigger than all the companies. He's bigger than the government. He's bigger than all the governments put together. And let me just share this testimony quickly. Last week, my brother-in-law, who works for the FBI in Idaho, has had numerous, over the years, numerous medical issues. Medical, I mean major. He's had his knees replaced. He, 10 years ago, had... Three, uh, a three, a triple bypass in his heart. And the last little while, he's been having pain in his heart again. And so he called the doctor. The doctor said, come in, we're going to do a heart cath. So last week, he, 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 he wants us to pray because he's having a car, you know, this, this procedure. And so they do the heart cath, and they came back and said, well, two of your arteries are 100% open, but one of them is 100% blocked. And, uh, you know, that's scary. And he said, well, what should we do? And the doctor said, well, nothing. What? He, he said, because around that artery, there are three small arteries that are growing there now. And they're going to get bigger, and the pain will go. And, you know, we serve a big God. They, they tried to explain it. They can't explain, you know, how it is that your heart recreates arteries around a blockage, you know. But God is big, and we serve a big God. And so today we're just here to say thank you. We're here, here today to declare that, that we serve a big God no matter where we are. God is bigger than our situation. God is bigger than any kind of need that we can bring to him. He is big. So I just want to leave you this morning with this, these thoughts. On our prayer card, uh, that you can pick up a copy of this in the back. And it's, it's, on the back of it is uh, how to pray for your family, how to pray for lost people. And there are ten, 10 things, and I'd like to just reference a couple of them. Number one, pray that God will soften their hearts. When you think of lost people, there's a reason they're lost, and it's probably because their heart is hard, and they haven't responded to the love of God yet. Pray that God, it says Ezekiel eleven nineteen. I will, I will call on the, and, and give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Pray that God would soften their hearts. So our first step in reaching lost people, God, soften their hearts. God, bring about circumstances that will soften their heart. Whatever it takes to get them to change. Because a lot of them have had wounds. They've been wounded by something or somebody or something. And, 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 and there has to be a healing of that wound. And, and so, and, 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 but God softened their hearts. The second one is ask for God to send a spirit of conviction. John 16, 8, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. 
And, and salvation is a supernatural thing and happens because God shows us our sins. I don't know if you remember that, but my life is so vivid. I remember I was seven years old. I had done all the evil possible. <laughs> I, had, I had disobeyed my parents. I had already stood in the, the corner. That was our discipline, standing in the corner for weeks, you know, because, because I was so bad. And, uh, but I'll never forget that night in a revival meeting in a tent. A, a, they don't do it anymore, but there was sawdust on the ground. And this preacher going, I don't know what he said, but there was this spirit that came in the room that touched my heart, that let me know that I was wrong and that God wanted me to bring my sins and confess my sins to him. And, you know, God radically changed me that night. And I, I don't know specifically if the call to ministry and missions and all that was there, but I, I think probably was because God put his hand on me that night. And I wept and wept for a half hour. I couldn't stop weeping and crying because of this incredible moment that came into my life and filled me with peace and the joy of the Lord. The very thing that, that, that the church in Atlanta got censored for last week, the peace and joy of God, is what this world seeks. And so we pray that God would send a spirit of conviction. In fact, in every of the great revivals, every one that you can, you can ever focus on, the, the, the underlying uh, uh, power of the revival is the conviction of the Holy Spirit to show people. A lot of the revivals came through preachers who weren't great preachers. But the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was the undergirding uh, 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 facet of, of the revival. Brussels is uh, a little bit over 35% Islamic. And it's, uh, we wonder why, why are they Islamic? I mean, the Islamic history of Europe and, and Europeans is, is pretty, I mean, they're, it's pretty bad. I mean, but now Islam is coming back. And here, here's what I believe about it. I believe that God is allowing them to come back to Europe because most of them in Brussels are from Morocco and Algeria mainly Morocco, and I believe they're there for a purpose, that they can hear the gospel because it's illegal to preach the gospel in Morocco and Algeria. But if they come to Europe, they can hear the gospel. So I pray God, send a revival. Some of these people are just seeking. They want something. They don't even know what it is. God, help them to go to a church that's on fire and can give them the life of Jesus Christ in their lives. And then the third thing, that, that we should pray for is a spirit of revelation. Ask God for uh, wisdom and revelation. E Ephesians 1.17, it says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you know him better. There's a revelatory power of the Holy Spirit where God shows us things, helps us to know things that we weren't taught. It's the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we need. And it's the way we know that we're on the right track. And I just pray, God, especially to our Islamic friends, God, reveal yourself to them. Show yourself and your power to them. It was just oh, 10 years ago I met the first person that I'd ever met that it had been that it had come to the Lord because of a revelatory thing in their life. I mean, a major revelation. And Grib Garziz is his name, and his brother was the one that got the revelation. And Grib noticed that there was peace in his younger brother. It was an Islamic family. Grib was just this mean, old, angry Islamic boy. And uh, he resolved his anxiety by fighting. <laughs> well, I, I never thought of that therapy before. But, uh, you, know, it, you know, a lot of us use it sometimes. But, and it works for a while. But with Grib, it, it worked for a while. And then suddenly it's... It's not working anymore. And he noticed that his brother had peace. And so he asked his brother. And his brother said, listen, I, I have had anger issues also, except I held them in. He was an internal person. He said, I held him inside. And before long, I had stomach problems and ulcers and find myself in the hospital. I was only 10 years old. I found myself in the hospital. 
And one night in the hospital, Jesus walks into my room. And he said to me, if you will follow me, I will show you how to live. And I will give you peace. And Grib says, I want that. Now Grib is an is a evangelist in Algeria. Lives in Dallas, but goes back and forth. Out is a church planter in Algeria. And he's uh, just a powerful man of God. And I said, well, you know, isn't it dangerous being Islamic, former Islamic, and, and uh, preaching the gospel so publicly? He said, well, yeah, it is dangerous. And he said to me, he says, the moment that God takes his hand off of me, I'm dead. They will kill me. But at the moment, they, God protects me. And I'm just at peace with God. And he is helping me and taking care of me. And then last year we had a, a pastor from Algeria, not related to Grib, but, but uh, had uh, somehow in uh, Algeria come across a Bible and started reading the Bible. And, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came in. And God began to reveal himself through the word of God. And he accepted Christ. You know, when you read the Gospel of John, it's hard not to. You know, read the Gospel of John, you find out that, that God is really real. And the Holy Spirit is really real. And God does miracles like grow arteries around blocked um, uh, 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 arteries in our hearts. And, but uh, he said, he, and then his friends wondered what was wrong with him. You know, what do you mean what's wrong? Well, you're way too happy, you know. And uh, he said, well, uh, okay, your friends, uh, he said, I read the Bible, found out that Jesus is really real. You know, eight friends of his accepted Christ. And they started this little Bible study. And it grew to about 20 people. Then it grew to about 50 people. And it grew to about 100 people. And they start saying, listen, you know, you're, you're going to have to be careful. We, this is too big of a group. The government is against a lot to do what we're doing. And, and, and you're the target. And he said, no, I'm here to serve God. He's real. He's really real. And uh, before long, it's 200 people. And by the time it's 500 people, he knows for sure the government is after him. And so he runs. In, he's living in Brussels now. And uh, uh I invited him to come to share this story with our students because they need to hear this kind of commitment that, 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 that people live under, that, that people make in their hearts and in their lives. And this guy is just a hero in my book, just a powerful man of God because he found a Bible in a place where it's against the law to have a Bible, and he shared it. And then the last story is the one that's in our magazine. I think when I was here last time, I shared this story in this magazine, I've got copies for everyone on, on our table back there. Um, uh, a guy named Robbie. It's the opening story in this magazine. Robbie is this guy, just a just a regular Syrian re refugee, Syrian terrorist who moved to Belgium. I mean, that was his ministry, killing people. He he says it just in the magazine. He says I, my ministry was killing people. And uh, one day he went out to kill someone, couldn't find the target, and. Um, uh, just mad, angry, turns the TV on that night. And there's this French evangelist preaching in French. <laughs> and he's just preaching the gospel. The French can really preach. You know? <laughs> they, they preach the gospel. And he stops and he says, and there's someone watching tonight that went out to kill someone today. And you couldn't find your target. And Jesus has your number. If you'll receive him, he's going to change your life and give you peace where there is depression. And, of course, that got Robbie's attention. How about you? What, what, what would it do to you? <laughs> I, it would have got my attention. I was like, ooh, you know, ah, this is, there's something real here. Well, Robbie accepted Christ. Now, Robbie is the most powerful evangelist, loves people. He come, comes to our school and he tells our students, he says, don't ever be afraid to tell a Muslim uh, about Jesus. Don't be afraid of it. He says, they have to hear the name Jesus eight times before they'll even start listening to what it's about. But if you keep at it, they're going to accept Christ. And this guy, God has given him the gift of faith. And, and he's just got this tenacity about him that I like, that I don't have, that I want, that I want to be like this guy because God is moving in his life. Pray for a spirit 
of revelation. And then the last one is pray for the revelation of God's love. You know, when God touches a person with his love, it's really hard for them to resist. It's hard for them to, to say no. Oh. You know, I was just at a church, a pastor here in Lakeland this Wednesday night. He told me a quick story about a guy he, had, he was working, when he first became a Christian, he was working, working in a construction group. And, and so this other guy was kind of a hard person, but he was very adamantly Christian. And one day, they were, they were getting ready to go uh, to work, and this other guy comes that he had been sharing Christ with came and just hit him in the head and <laughs> knocked him on the ground. And uh, he got up and, you know, he, because he was, he's kind of a hard guy, you expect him to get up and hit the other guy, hit, hit, the, hit the guy hit him. But he got up and he said, he turned his cheek and he said, okay, okay, hit, hit right here. <laughs> I, and he said, and the guy that hit him said, no, I, I was just trying to see if the gospel you preach is really real. I, I was just trying to find out if you really love like you say you do. You know, when people get a revelation of the love of God, suddenly he is irresistible. Romans 2, 4, it says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that it's the kindness of God, it's God's kindness that leads you toward repentance. You know, when the love of God happens, people can't resist it. I don't know about you, but I often have to say, God, rebaptize me in your love. I need a fresh dose of the love of God. Because the world makes us hard. And it, and it, and it, it, it just erases some of the, the joy we had, but the love of God comes back in. I'm telling you, it makes the church powerful. And so in, in, in closing, I just want to share a couple of things about um, revivals that have happened in, um, in Europe. The great um, uh, Welch revival, 1904, uh, was led by a young student, or young man, Evan Roberts, and uh, just, he was a prayer person. He, he, and no doubt he had got to the place where he was praying for the love of God. His pastor gave him the pulpit late on a Wednesday night. And he went around the room and, and made everyone pray the prayer, Oh God, um, uh, 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 um, save Wales for Jesus Christ's sake. And shortly after that, uh, this great revival um, uh, within a couple of months after that, Wales was changed. Crime was reduced to almost nothing. Often magistrates were given ceremonial pairs of white gloves because they didn't have anyone coming to the court that day. Um, a reporter went to a police station wondering what the policemen were doing now because there was so little crime. I mean, this was an incredible revival of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that God did in Wales. And so this reporter goes and he asks a question, what are you policemen doing now? And he said, well, we used to serve two purposes, dealing with crime and controlling crowds. And now that the revival has come, there's no crime. So we go to where the crowds are, to churches. We have several good singing voices and among our policemen, so we form three quartets and we sing at the meetings whenever we get a chance. <laughs> This is what God can do in a country. This is what God did in Wales. And another revival that took place in Hernhut, Germany, going way back. I tell this story for the purpose of letting you know that missions today is because of these people in Hernhut. It was a Count Zinzendorf. He was a German. It's a kind of a long story, but his dad died when he was just really, really young. His mom remarried to a general who lived in Dresden, or in Berlin, and, uh, and she moved. He was raised by his grandmother. And his grandmother was a very godly woman who taught him the Bible. And he had the word of God so ingrained in his heart that all he wanted to do with his life was to please God. And he thought pleasing God would be the path.
pastor. But because he was an aristocrat, a higher level in, in that time, in those times, the kings and the courts and all that were just a whole level above us regular people. They, they said, no, you can't be a pastor. But I want to be a pastor. No, you can't do that. You can't congregate with regular people. But he had the love of God in his heart. And so the Reformation caused a lot of turmoil and there were Moravians coming to, 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 to running for their lives and he gave them some of his land and then some Bohemians came and then some other groups came and he allowed them to, to and they called the place Herndhut in, in, in uh, eastern, southeastern Germany. And, um, but because of differences, because the Bohemians used to worship God one way and the Moravians used to worship God another way. And, and before long, I mean, there was this big fight. And, and, and of course, it was, it was before he became a pastor, but he, he had to be the lawyer in Dresden in, in the courts. And um, so he came back to, to Hernhut and he went door to door appealing to the people to forgive each other and to let the, the love of God heal their hearts. And, and he just, just went, I mean, he, he contacted each of the groups and each of the people going, just saying, you know, God can do this. We don't have to be divided. God can help us. And, and he had some method. He was also a songwriter and poet, and he's credited for being the first worship people. He brought worship to the church. Uh, and in 1727, in August, um, during their morning service. They had gone through this moment of uh, forgiveness, this, this time of forgiveness. Um, and this Sunday morning, um, it was like the Holy Spirit dropped in. And the reports are just really, really amazing. But it was like revival came to Hernhut, to these people. You know, usually prayer comes first <laughs> and then forgiveness and then revival you know it was backwards this time it was it was forgiveness and then revival I'm telling you it was a powerful Pentecostal revival they didn't understand why people were saying what they're saying we, we, you know I mean we we know now why, why we don't understand what they're saying and people were falling on the floor and that was just weird you know just out of order completely but the presence of God was so powerful and God touched them. And then it was, it was um, two weeks later, a group of those people, 24 of them, said, we need to pray for our world. We need to pray for our families. We need to really be people of prayer. We're Pentecostal. I mean, they didn't say this. We're Pentecostal now. But the power of the Holy Spirit turned them into powerful prayer people. <laughs> and they said, we got to pray for lost people and for our families. And so they decided, these 24 people decided that we're going to pray round the clock, 24 hours a day. And two of them were praying every hour of the day. And then a few months later, they felt uh, this urgency to take the gospel to other places. And before long, Hearn Hutt is sending missionaries all over the world. And by the end, by 1800, this was 1727, by 1800, they had sent 2,000 missionaries from their little community in Herna, Germany. And these people had gone everywhere, preaching the gospel, sharing the love of God. And this prayer meeting that they started went on for over 110 years. And you know that everything we know about missions today, when we when we call mod, what we say modern missions, and modern views that are anti-pre-reformation. I mean, it's the love of God, not the power of the church. It's the love of God. That's what the Moravians taught, and that's what they believed, and that's what they demonstrated, and that's what they shared with the world. And they funded their whole thing. They, they I mean, they, they reached the world in their time because of forgiveness, of Pentecost and prayer. And I, I say today, God, Lord, we call on you today. We call on you. We want you to show us great and mighty things that we 
know not. Because we can see the darkness coming. But I, I, I want to see you lifted up. I want to see the power of God raised in the marketplace, in, in, in our community, in our cities, in our state, in our nation. We serve a big God. He's a God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. And God says to us today, call on me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things you know not. Now maybe you're here today and you need a touch in your heart. I want you to know the presence of the Holy Spirit is here today to touch you, to touch us. You might be here today because of a need of anxiety and depression. And I tell you what, our God will totally deliver you from any kind of anxiety or depression. Or you may be here today and you need guidance in your life. What am I to do? Where am I to go? What's going on with me? I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit is here today to touch our lives. He says, call on me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things you know not.